All right, guys, Murph's here. And today we're gonna to do a little discussion and comparison. We're going to discuss and compare shotguns versus rifles in a tactical environment. Now, long-term viewers of the channel know that I did a series on shotguns in home defense. And there's a lot of discussion, some comparison in rifles during that series. And if you're interested in that, I'll go ahead and post links in the description with it. A caveat and a warning that that was very early on in the channel so <laughs> you know it's taken a while to kind of uh, round out the edges and stuff like that on my content so that stuff is very long very dry very boring just like honestly a lot of the content on my channel in addition to that I want to make sure first off we identify that this is by no means a scientific comparison this is more or less just meant to generate data, a little bit of entertainment value and all that kind of stuff so that somebody who's looking to get involved in these types of processes has something to work off of. And for people who've been involved in it in a little while, I bet you I can identify a flaw in your system. We'll discuss this a little bit further here now when we talk about what are we defining as tactical in this case. Are we talking about like home defense? Are we talking about like a truck gun or something along those lines? When I say tactical, I'm thinking primarily in the terms of Somebody who does this for a living, operates firearms and all that kind of stuff, so law enforcement, military, contractors, all those types of things, as well as anybody who's looking to be the armed and prepared citizen. So, you know, you've got your, your loadout and all that kind of stuff, you got your body armor, you got this, that, and the other thing in order to be able to, you know, really, truly live what the Second Amendment was meant for. These are some things that you should consider along with that when it comes to firearms selection. Because there's a lot of myths, there's a lot of old information out there about how shotguns fit in type things, these types of things. Which is not to say that shotguns do not. That's not where I'm going with this. It is to say that there's a lot more discussion that has to be thoroughly vetted when it comes to the pros and cons. Because it's really easy to sit around here and talk about the pros and cons of rifles and shotguns. It's a completely different thing to see it put on a timer, to see it demonstrated out on the range. And we'll get into that later on in the video. Now, first off, guys, when it comes to the kind of tactical use of shotguns, be it by the prepared citizen or the qualified professional, shotguns out or predate rifles. I mean, you start off with smoothbore weapon systems, you know, match locks and flint locks and all that kind of stuff. It was very, it didn't take much effort for someone to be like, man, I could shove more than one projectile down this barrel. You also had things like the blunderbuss, where it was like, man, this thing is wide enough, I could shove anything down the barrel and turn it into a little, little deck clearer, if you're thinking about it in a naval type sense. The benefits of shoving multiple projectiles down a bore became very clear whenever it came to shooting at like birds or other fast moving animals which is why early shotguns would be referred to as fouling pieces because by having multiple projectiles you increased your overall hit probability now as the americas would be settled and such as that the traveler homesteader and settler would find a lot of utility out of the shotgun not just putting food on the table, but also defending themselves from competing interests and people. The shotgun would become pivotal in many different like colloquial terms and stuff like that. Like, uh, for instance, riding shotgun. That refers to the person that rode next to the guy driving a stagecoach, which allowed that guy to continue to handle the team while somebody else was responsible for the defense of the stagecoach. Shotgun blast refers to the shotgun's destructive power and also its ability to be able to project that destructive power over a wide space. So if you shotgun blast something or, you know, shotgun pattern something, you're throwing out a lot of options all at once or you're getting hit with a lot of things all at once. The shotgun would be the police officer's best friend throughout the 19th, 20th, and into the 21st century. Loved for its utility as well as uh, ability to communicate with the masses. I remember some years ago, I was working with a uh, uniform division secret service guy, right? So guy who like, you know, wears the body armor and all that kind of stuff, carries tactical rifle, all those types of things. And he came up and he set down a AR in a, you know, zippered, gun case that he had open and you know we're working a checkpoint and he said hey man if uh something goes down you probably better understand how to work that than i do i used to be a louisiana police officer i'm more used to a shotgun and it's amazing 
how everyone rethinks their lives whenever they're staring down the super pipe that is the barrel of a shotgun. So, the shotgun has also seen quite a bit of military application. It was loved and vaunted during World War I in which the Germans actually tried to get it banned from military use for being inhumane, which is insane to me when you have a whole bunch of countries that are you know, dropping phosgene, mustard, and nerve agents on each other and you know, somebody else comes along and says, the shotgun is inhumane. That's just insane to me. It would see use in the Pacific Theater during World War II in the jungles of Vietnam, and then also used by Marines and the SAS, most notably, during the GWAT. The rifle, on the other hand, is no slouch whenever it comes to historic use by private and professional alike. The rifle, or at least rifle marksmanship, is attributed to the American success in the War of Independence. The Inability for the United States to adapt to emer adapt tactics to emerging technology would account for the horrors of the American Civil War. Of course, the rifle would see all kinds of military use as we go into the cartridge age. And in the 90s, you would start to see rifles being adopted by police who came to realize that the threats that they were facing needed to be handled with something with a little bit more precision or perhaps a little bit more capacity and range and all those types of things, which is not the first time that law enforcement has run into this type of thing. If you, if you look at Prohibition in the 1930s, very quickly law enforcement found themselves outgunned by gangsters when they were just run, when law enforcement were just using, you know, 1897 pump action shotguns, maybe some Winchester rifles or something along those lines. And you would see law enforcement very quickly adopt Thompsons and BARs and stuff like that in order to be able to counter that same threat from mobsters and, you know, all that kind of stuff. The rifle would also start to more and more find its identity amongst the civilian populace with access to rifles like the you know, M1 carbine early on being the AR-15 of its time period and now the AR-15 moving forward, which the AR-15 struggled somewhat in popularity and, and a lot of that was also hampered. I say struggle, keep in mind when we're talking about tactical application, not just something that you can have to giggle. When you're talking about tactical application, there was a lot of division in the Second Amendment community once upon a time that anybody who was utilizing rifles for tactical type applications were some sort of gun nut talking to God on a two-way radio type of deal. And I think that image, at least in the Second Amendment community, has softened over time. The 1994 assault weapons ban would inhibit some of that, would kind of set us back a little bit, but when that sunset in 2004, we would start to see a, an expansion of the use of these, the AR-15, the AK-47, you know, AK pattern rifles and all that kind of stuff in the defensive type realms. And this would very slowly gain speed as, you know, people viewing AR-15s as something to be able to utilize in home defense type situations. And I think a lot of this was also bolstered by the GWAT where you have a ton of veterans that served in the 20 year long war that came out at some point during it for one reason or another, and then still wanted to be able to stay in touch with that aspect of self-defense. So I think that's where you see, you know, this recent boom and a lot of like instructors and courses and all that kind of stuff geared towards the tactical rifle. Now I will still say that whenever it comes to defensive type things, most people, everybody views the handgun as the most viable defensive option for the civilian practitioner of firearms. Because they are so portable, everybody has, a, you know, everyone who's really into this type of stuff has a handgun that they can seal carry at least one, has a handgun that they probably use for home defense and all that kind of stuff. But some people kind of just stop there and think that they are is as armed as somebody like myself who has, you know, quite a few different systems to be able to run. And that's not necessarily the case if you think you're trying to step into the same shoes that I'm trying to occupy, which is I am that armed, prepared citizen as well as... Uh, an armed professional. So it's kind of the dynamic there that you got to keep in mind. Now, growing up, I was always told that shotguns were the ideal option for close range defense as well as home defense type stuff. And that really put rifles on the back burner. I think that type of thought process is what has put rifles on the back burner for the vast majority of people. Overall, I will tell you that my defensive strategy is kind of uh, paralleling like what they teach in law enforcement, excuse me. And that is that. I utilize a handgun to fight my way to a 
larger weapon system to a long gun to in military terminology would be a higher casualty producing weapon system that is my intent that is my purpose and all that kind of stuff and whenever it is that i'm utilizing handgun and i keep long guns on hand for that purpose now one more thing that i want to go ahead and identify before we get into the comparison portion of this is that when i say rifle i mean something chambered in a rifle cartridge i do not mean pccs we can do a separate conversation at another time about shotguns versus pccs but we are talking about true rifles in this case, something chambered in at least an intermediate cartridge, if not something larger. So AR-10s, AR-15s, AKs, PSA Jackals, whatever it is that you're looking at, that's the type of rifle that we are talking about in this case. All right, guys, so with that, why don't we go ahead and get into our comparison so, portion, starting off with the pros and cons, and starting with shotguns. The great thing about shotguns is that you can put a variety of different types of ammunition in a shotgun. You, and since we're primarily looking at tactical shotguns in this case, we're talking about buckshot, slugs, less than lethal loads, and then like dedicated breaching loads and stuff like that. The shotgun becomes a very versatile tool in this case. Buckshot, if you're trying to, you know, swing on targets, maybe uh, potentially engaging multiple close range threats. Slugs, if you're having to push that distance out a little bit further, 100 yards-ish, depending on your sighting system. We'll go over that more after a bit. And then less than lethal loads if you're law enforcement or somebody who deals with trying to de-escalate a situation with non-lethal or less lethal options. It's an important thing to remember. I always bring this up whenever it is that the discussion turns to less lethal loads. They are called less lethal, not non-lethal. You can still kill people with a beanbag round. This is a really great function of the shotgun. This is why it has remained so relevant for so many different things. Of course, shotguns are very powerful over the distance that they are able to project their power and all that kind of stuff. Nobody's turning down a load of buckshot to the chest. That's for sure. They are definitely out of the fight with that number of wound channels, that amount of shock to the body and all that kind of stuff. They are going down for sure. A lot of times people will cite the simplicity of a shotgun and stuffing, you know, showing somebody how to stuff rounds into the magazine tube, where the slide release and all that kind of stuff to be able to cycle a manually operated action. That manual of arms is very simple. We'll go over that more here. We'll bring some more context to that portion of the discussion here in just a little bit. Okay, well, what are the pros of rifles? Well, one of the great things about rifles is that you have more distance that can be used with that. You can use a rifle at bad breath distance all the way out to 500 yards and beyond. So if you're needing more versatility, not necessarily in your ammunition selection, but in your engagement envelope, then yes, a rifle is a fantastic option. If I were operating in, you know, let's say Kandahar, Afghanistan, and only had a shotgun, I would feel very undergunned especially because a lot of the engagements in Cannon Harbor characterize as being beyond 300 yards. So definitely out of range of the shotgun, you know? So like, great, if we're working in a village and stuff like that, and we're, you know, potentially have to do some breaching type stuff, the shotgun's gonna be great. But Kandahar didn't necessarily have a lot of like house to house fighting in it as much as it did have some kind of standoff distance type engagements. So shotgun would be kind of useless there. Now the rifle is more relevant and actually something that's kind of accurized or optimized for greater distance fighting is what is the better option at that point. Rifles do not lose any amount of power when you're talking about, you know, be it close range or projecting energy at distance and all that kind of stuff. Even if you're working at the extent of like a five, five, six rounds capability, putting holes in somebody at you know 600 meters with a 55 grain bullet is better than missing them with something with you know a shotgun slug so there's that rifles also lend themselves greater to accuracy shotguns are not built to be accurate you're never going to see a sniper slug gun type of deal, but you will see a lot of precision rifles engaging out to thousands of yards in sub MOA accuracy different tools for different jobs in this case. And that's a huge premise of this entire conversation at this point is we have to make sure that we understand what these tools are doing for us and how it is that we properly utilize them. Okay, so there's the pros, very, very rapid pros. What are the cons of shotguns? Well, the problem with shotguns, in my opinion, is that they are rounds limited. 
you are dealing with very short capacities. Even if you see like a drum magazine and something like an AA-12, that drum magazine holds like 10 rounds and it's massive. Shotguns themselves are very large cartridges. They take up a lot of space. They take up a lot of mass. The rim cartridge casing does not make them efficient in a magazine and stuff like that, which makes the magazines very large as well. And pretty limited capacity in it, on top of that. So even if you start to see these like huge banana magazines that some like competition shooters are running and stuff like that, they're still not carrying as many rounds as you would find in a 30 round magazine on a rifle. In addition to these things being rounds limited, that means that you're going to have to spend a lot of time reloading them. And shotguns are not easy to reload. When you're talking about tubular magazine designs, the fastest way to reload these is to take, you know, two shotgun shells or, or double load or quad load, taking two shotgun shells or four shotgun shells and stripping them into the feed port as fast as you can. That's still not very fast because you have to secure that ammunition, peel it off, strip it in, peel off that ammunition, strip it in, all that kind of stuff. You could say you could solve this with those box type magazines that we discussed previously. However, there's a couple things you got to take into account with box magazines. First off, Historically, magazines and rim cartridge casings aren't always the best fit. You do increase the possibility of malfunctions at that point. And in addition to that, if you leave those magazines loaded for any extended period of time, you can run into a different type of feed issue, which is you have spring tension pressing against those shotgun shells, which are made of plastic. So that top shell is getting pressed against the feed lips and will eventually deform which means that you'll run into malfunctions in any of the magazines that you kept loaded for that length of time that it took for that shotgun shell to deform. That's something you have to keep in mind. If this is something that you're looking to just have, you know, sitting around in your ready rack or, you know, in your police cruiser or that you have loaded up in your, your plate carrier or your, you know, your Rhodesian setup or whatever it is that it may be, if they sit in there for too long, if you don't cycle those rounds out every once in a while, you're going to run into issues. This is also something when we talk about the reloads and potential malfunction clearance is an issue with the simplicity of shotguns. I call it simple complexity. Yes, it's very simple to be able to teach somebody how to run it, but when we talk about running it fast, efficient, and tactically, it becomes very difficult. So that's why an AR-15 having, you know, maybe more switches and buttons and all that kind of stuff does give you more options to be able to run things very smoothly and very efficiently. When we're talking about semi-automatic shotguns, we run into some potential ammo finickiness with them just built inherently built into the system. So you run into it less with recoil operated systems. The problem with recoil operated semi-automatic shotguns is that they have a tendency to be a little bit slower in cycling. Probably not a big deal to the vast majority of people who are not competition shooters. You're not going to outrun the bolt with the trigger. But if you're talking about gas operated systems, which are a little bit lighter and a little bit faster cycling, they a lot of times will have some type of threshold. Some semi-automatic shotguns will only run properly with like high brass ammunition. Others have a velocity threshold you have to maintain, 1200, 1300 feet per second, whatever it is that it may be. Now, again, we are talking about tactical type applications. So we're talking buckshot slugs, all buckshot slugs, right? So those are probably going to be attaining the pressures and the velocities and all that kind of stuff to properly cycle your, your semi-automatic action. When you switch to less lethal loads, that dynamic changes. There's a high probability that that action will not cycle. And that's why Benelli came out with like the M3 and the like spaz and stuff like that so that you could switch between semi-automatic and manually operated to be able to rack out rounds should you be utilizing less lethal loads. Pump action shotguns are more reliable as we often as we often state whenever it is that we're talking about manually cycled actions, but they are also slower. And we did a comparison on that, semi-automatic versus pump action shotguns. I'll throw the link in the description to that as well. Okay, so there's the cons of the shotgun. What are the cons of the rifle? The issue with rifles becomes over penetration. If you're working, uh, say in a law enforcement type incident, if you're working in populated areas, you know, doing like, um, warrants and stuff like that or serving warrants in you know an apartment building or something along those lines you take your ar-15 with you you run the risk of over penetration not just through like okay oh i missed my target wide and i punched a couple holes in the wall you could potentially over penetrate through the target then through the wall kill a family member that's not involved in what it is that's going on kill a neighbor something along those lines so now you're dealing with the possibility of you know expanding this into a, like an, a murder investigation when you were just trying to take down some dirt bag. 
This is a very key portion of this to look at because yeah, rifles are great at chipping away at somebody else's cover, especially if you're running like a 308 or something along those lines, or a great way to complicate somebody's body armor solution, but that penetration comes with very tangible risks associated with it, which is why a lot of people might not necessarily want to utilize it for their tactical purposes if they live in a populated area. Now, if we're talking about it in more of a military type sense, that overpenetration, while not completely irrelevant, it you know it's still a consideration. It's less of a consideration because you're actually working in war zones now, unless you're doing stability operations. But that's kind of getting down into a whole separate rabbit hole there. Stability operations, yes, absolutely. When you're trying to restore law and order and you know get a government back up and running and all that kind of stuff, taking down some terrorist in their home and killing the family next door in the process does not help you with that long term. That was, a, that was a concept that a lot of people struggled with during the GWAT, and I'm I'll probably hear something about it in the comments section as well. All right, so that's our discussion portion on pros and cons between these two systems. Why don't we go ahead and introduce our players for the actual range portion of this discussion. So, representing shotguns will be this. That was weird. Will be this Mossberg 500, chambered in 12 gauge. And representing rifles will be this SBR built on an Aero Precision upper and lower set that I have affectionately termed my Splenda gerbil, which if you're interested in reviews on this rifle, I actually have the original review as well as the update review, links in the description. Now, if we look at these two guns, we can see that there's quite a difference in how it is that they're appointed. So this is where the less than scientific portion of this comparison comes in. However, here's the deal here, guys. There are an awful lot of guys out there that have ARs that look like this with lights and optics and backup irons and all that kind of stuff and shotguns that look like this for their home defense or tactical type needs. So that's the portion where I say, hey, Guys who've even been doing this for a little while should probably pay attention at this point because I have no lights, I have no optics, I have nothing on this but the bead sight and this crappy shell carrier that is vestigial at this point. I just haven't removed it for whatever reason. So, this is where you want to start to pay attention as kind of a side note to this overall discussion and comparison that we're going on on the range. Now, let's go ahead and talk about our range conditions here because there's a couple caveats we gotta knock out for that as well. So we're gonna be shooting three different drills at three different distances, evaluating different aspects of both of these weapon systems as indicative of their categories. One thing to note is that I'm going to shoot this shotgun entirely at steel, but for the close range portions of this, I will be shooting this rifle at my paper target. And that is because I observe a 50 yard minimum distance for engaging steel with a rifle. I am very much so paranoid of like debris from that, you know, disintegrating projectile coming back at me, let alone a complete ricochet or something along those lines. I've already got a bullet in me, I don't really need any additional. So I try to do the best that I could to replicate the same size of target on my paper target, but for the close range portions of this, the rifle will be shown on paper. And then once we step out to the long range portions of this, both guns will be shot on steel. Now this was done off the timer and I actually did relatively low round counts for reasons that will become apparent once we get into the actual discussion here, I kind of I kind of foresaw this as a possibility and leaned into it. This shotgun was shot with some low brass target loads, uh, some birch that was like number eight or something along those lines. That's because first, like buckshot and slugs and stuff like that are kind of expensive, but that's probably what you'd be training with anyway. The the thing to talk about here is what constitutes an impact on steel whenever it is that you're shooting birdshot. And for me, it's I have to be able to tell that the steel moved with those impacts. I put enough of that shot pattern on the steel to actually get it to swing. Anything less than that is not full impact. We'll talk about that more here. It'll play a role here more in a minute. 
All right, guys, so starting off with the, or getting into the drill, starting off with our close drill. This is a drill shot at seven yards. The steel target is a C-zone size steel, and then, of course, the paper is as close as I could replicate a C-zone size target on paper. And then we will start off with the shotgun, three rounds from the low ready. Let's see how it goes. All right, so I went ahead and I rolled in both videos, both the shotgun and the rifle. Let's go ahead and discuss our results real quick. Real quick. The shotgun did it in 1.97 with all hits. Fantastic, those are good results. The rifle did it in 1.41 with all hits, as would be expected. So the rifle is over half a second faster on this particular drill. Couple things that I noticed, I had more of an issue with height over bore with the rifle because of course my optic sits up much higher than the bead sight on this shotgun. And that's just something that you kind of have to take into account whenever it is that you're doing close range stuff depending upon your zero with a rifle. Seven yards, pretty close. I thought I was holding up high enough for what it was that I was doing. My shots did wind up going a little bit lower, but they did all hit target. And that's the really important thing here in this case. So that drill, fairly successful overall. I, this, it's kind of what I would expect. I would expect the shotgun to do really great at those close range type scenarios. That's like home defense type distances and all that kind of stuff. And the shotgun is performing more than adequately in that space. So next is our near drill. This is moving back to 15 yards and engaging the target with lateral movement, which I haven't done lateral movement in a while. So let's go ahead and check that out now. All right, so the shotgun did it in 2.16 with two misses. However, the rifle did it in 2.06 also with two misses. So it's been a while since I've done lateral movement and I decided that with just firing three rounds and all that kind of stuff, I could reshoot this drill and try to get a better feel for what it is that's going on. So let's go ahead and check out the reshoot starting with the shotgun yet again. All right, so on that reshoot, I got a 2.20 with one miss. And I actually had to like replay that video and zoom in very closely on the target and maybe being a little gracious, granted it a second hit. So 2.20, whereas the rifle did it in 1.29. We had a significant increase in speed, all hits this time around. Okay. However, I still didn't feel like I had given the shotgun a fair shake, so at this point, I came back through and did it a third time. And here, I got a 2.41 and still with one miss, with a pretty solid miss at that. So I started to kind of question whether or not at 15 yards with this particular load and an improved cylinder choke, if there was enough of a pattern, if there was a tight enough pattern to actually swing the steel appropriately for me to be able to grade effective hits. So I just dumped three rounds on it real fast. And what we found was yes, absolutely. I can still move that steel with all three hits as long as I'm getting as much of the pattern on there as possible. Now, the, the, the statement here might be, well, Murph, you know, if you were shooting buckshot or something like that 
and you had like two or three rounds of buckshot hit that thing, it would move, you know, even if it was on the edge of the pattern. But let's talk about that a little bit further. Yes, it's really great that a 12 gauge, you know, two and three quarter inch double out buck load holds like 30, or yeah, excuse me, holds like eight to nine 32 caliber projectiles, little round balls in it. And that's wonderful because yes, I do not inherently want to be shot at all, let alone with a 32 ACP. However, for most people, 32 ACP is not considered to be an effective defensive firearm. And that's when we're talking about a projectile that's actually a little bit more aerodynamic than a round ball. So ostensibly, the velocity should be getting higher. Now, actually, shotguns are generating higher velocities than what you're going to find in your common 32 ACP because you have a larger overall cartridge that's able to hold more powder and all that kind of stuff. But I would bet that, or I would go so far as to say that they will lose that velocity much faster because those projectiles are not aerodynamic, they're spreading out and all that kind of stuff, that, that energy is diminishing very rapidly. All of this to say, yes, you could catch somebody with the edge of your shot pattern and put two or three 32 caliber round ball into them, and they would not be happy with their lives. They would definitely have stuff that they have to appraise. If you put a couple of rounds in the you know, thoracic cavity or something along those lines, you are causing them issues. However, you did not necessarily kill them. As you might if you put the whole shot load on them. So I feel like in this case, this comparison still stands because I'm catching, with, I'm catching that target with the edge and really I want the full pattern on there. Now really what it comes down to is, I don't think I've ever done lateral shotgun shooting or lateral movement while shooting a shotgun, especially not off of a bead sight. So it's probably something I should work on a little bit more. The rifle, on the other hand, I put those rounds you know, on the second go around, you know, giving myself a little bit of grace here on the second go around, I put those rounds right where they need to go. And it's not a matter of like, oh, well, I only caught him with the edge of the bullet or something along those lines. Those rounds went center mass. It was much easier to be able to manage that recoil. And it's a semi-auto. I don't have to manually cycle the action or anything, which is causing more disturbance to my sights, in addition to bobbing as I walk and shoot and all that kind of stuff. So trying to regain that stable platform while cycling the action and continuing that movement because the idea here is that I'm getting shot at as well and I don't want to just stand there and get shot. That's the whole point of incorporating some type of movement into your shooting. You know, be it moving offline or you know, you're working towards cover or something along those lines, you want to be able to do that type of stuff. All right, so even taking the best time with the most hits for the lateral movement, which is 2.20 on the second go around, the rifle's a second faster, or right around a second faster. Okay. So now we go to our third drill, which is the far drill. In this case, I go back to 50 yards, and both times we will be engaging the steel target. So for this, of course, I'm not going to turn this improved cylinder shotgun with number eight shot and try to shoot the steel at 50 yards and expect that I'm going to be able to read hits on that. Absolutely not. For this, I did bring out some two and three quarter inch slugs. And the whole goal here for this was I was going to start at a ready position and then drop behind cover, in this case a table, and engage the target with three rounds. So let's go ahead and see how that went. All right, guys, so for the far drill, the shotgun did it in 6.41 with two misses, whereas the rifle did it in 5.35 all hits. So again, we have a second difference between the two guns with the rifle proving to be more accurate. Now, once again, I'm shooting a bead sight at 50 yards. I'm pretty happy that I hit the target once. I kind of hoped I'd hit it more than once, but you know, be it as it may, that's how things worked out in this case. If I'd had an optic on this shotgun, it would have been a different outcome, I am sure. And of course, 
The Splendid Gerbil had absolutely no problem. 50 yards for this type of rifle is just absolute cake. There's, there's no way that this gun would not perform well. I've taken it out to further distances and it has performed just as well. So very easy win for the Splendid Gerbil. Why don't we go ahead and talk about the results here a little bit. The rifle in every metric was faster by at least half a second, if not over a second. Is that a big deal? Ostensibly, yes, seconds count. Your ability to be able to engage a target faster, follow up shots, all that kind of stuff, those are very important things. Fights are seldom finished. A lot of quotes out there for like self-defense fights and stuff like that, it's, it's um, you know one to three rounds fired and all this kind of stuff. If you're talking about a tactical sense, it will be much more than that. More rounds will be exchanged. The opponent may take more hits for them to actually go down as those rounds go into them, especially since when we talk about like a rifle and stuff like that, we run the possibility of ice picking through a target and not necessarily causing as much damage as we want to, whereas if I put a slug into somebody at any distance that a slug can reach them, they will go down. There's gonna be massive amounts of destruction to the things that keep a person standing when you pass a slug through somebody. Whereas with some rifles, if you start ice picking through them, you may not cause quite the array of damage that you need to. But those follow-up shots, if you don't necessarily land that first one because you're moving and he's moving and, and there's cover involved and all that kind of stuff, all that type of stuff is going to be integral to you being able to get fire superiority, for you to be able to overcome your opponent through accurate fire and hits. So yes, seconds count in this case, absolutely. Plus we need some sort of metric to go up against because I can't just go around shooting at people. So the rifle pretty soundly beat the shotgun in this case. However, I would point out that where they were closest was the close range type fighting, which is where the shotgun does excel. Now, another thing to keep in mind is that this rifle is actually outfitted for these purposes, whereas, this shotgun is not, but this is where we come back to the original statement of a lot of my friends in the firearms community have shotguns that look like this, that are their home defense options or their shotgun option for their tactical type purposes, and it has nothing added to optimize it for that use. No light, no optic, no nothing. That is something that needs to be fixed because right now you are giving yourself a false sense of safety whenever it comes to this weapon system. You need to optimize it for its, its purposes. You need to make sure that it is as optimized as your fighting rifle if you're expecting it to fulfill a similar capacity to a fighting rifle. This is a huge oversight for an awful lot of people and I see it far more often than I should. It's just like people who own pistol grip shotguns. They hardly ever take them out and shoot them, but they now have a false sense of safety whenever it comes to utilizing their pistol grip shotgun. To me, that's the biggest takeaway overall from this discussion, from this review, is that this obviously needs more of my attention. I need to set this up, and it's on my to-do list. I just have many, many things that are on my to-do list, as always. Now, of course, that is still to say that shotguns are very limited in distance, and if we're talking about having to have that wider engagement envelope, well, this may be not necessarily what it is that I would pick. I would not want to, to run this rifle if I was expecting it to live at 300 yard engagements, but this is the type of thing that you might want to take into account whenever it is that you're selecting different weapon systems for your purposes once you've picked a category. All right, guys. I think that pretty much covers my thoughts on this particular subject. I hope you guys found this interesting, and that's pretty much what I got. Have a good day.